In this episode of Paul's Old Crap, we're going to simulate a dial-up ISP and have various old computers dial into a router for internet access. To get things started, we need to ask ourselves, what is a modem? The word modem comes from modulator-demodulator, and its purpose is to allow for digital transmissions over analog lines. Dial-up modems work over standard phone lines and have evolved over the years to reach the maximum allowable bandwidth of 56 kilobits per second, not counting the use of text or image compression. These days, cable and DSL modems are probably the most common for internet access, leaving legacy dial-up modems for people out of range of these services. Here's a look at the kinds of dial-up modems I have in my collection. Alright, so what I've got here is a pile of modems. I'm just going to go over the different types of modems that I've collected over the years, and, uh, yeah. Starting off, this is a Global Village modem. Uh, this one is, I think it's called uh, a Geoport, is the plug that it uses. It actually draws its power from the, uh, the specific port on the Macintosh computer. Uh, this one is Teleport Gold 2 for Macintosh Performa. So, you'll notice it doesn't actually have a power switch or a spot for a power adapter. It's just the interface cable and the spot for the phone lines. We'll move on to this one, which is the standard type of modem. A, this is the Global Village Teleport Platinum. So this one is just a regular serial cable on the back of the Mac, and it does have the plug for the power adapter, which I've got here, and the actual power switch. This particular modem, um, I've actually had this for probably about 20 years. It was a uh, going away gift from a friend of mine as I was leaving uh, Vancouver, uh, I think in like 1997 or 1998. And I used this extensively on uh, my old Mac at the time, and uh, actually hosted uh, hotline servers and various things on a private phone line I had in my house. So, yeah, this is a 20 to 8 modem, and I really, really like this. So I'm going to probably hang on to this uh, forever, you know, just play around with it sometimes, like I've been doing with this uh, project here. Uh, this one is a US Robotics 14.4 fax modem. I don't have the power plug or the interface plug for this, so I'll probably never be able to use it. Uh, I'm not too sure where I even got this from, but uh, US Robotics is one of the more well-known names for modems, so this is just a neat piece of history to have. This one, I think is my oldest modem. Um, it's an Apple modem, and it's basically just called modem, so I'm not entirely sure what speed this is. If I had to venture a guess, I might say uh, a 300, oh, actually it says here, modem 1200. So, uh, like a 1200 BPS modem, I guess. Uh, I don't have the, uh, this has a very weird type of power plug, it's just like three pins in there. Uh, I don't have that, nor do I have this cable. Um, I'm not even sure if this was made for the Macintosh or the Apple II. But uh, this is probably a rare piece of hardware, so even though I can't uh, use it, I'm going to hang on to this for a while. This one here, uh, it's another Macintosh modem. This is a Supra Express 336 modem. Interesting thing about this one is it uses the standard serial plug, but it also gets its power from ADB. So you don't actually need a separate power adapter for this. You just plug both of these into the back of your computer, and it's got the ADB pass-through, so if you're using a desktop computer and you've got your keyboard and mouse, you can still plug it in here and plug this into the back of the computer for its power. Talking about PC card modems, I've got three here. Uh, we've got an IBM 14.4 data fax modem. Another one here just says modem 33.6. Um, I've never heard of whatever company this is supposed to be. Uh, these two PC card modems here, um, they've got little uh, kind of plugs that are inside here, and that requires you to have a dongle cable, which goes from here directly into the phone line. Um, I'm sure I've got one of those kicking around here somewhere, 
but this is the modem I prefer to actually use. This is a megahertz 14.4 modem, and I use this because it has the jack built into the PC card. So this is a very convenient modem, and it's got a lot of compatibility. Um, you'll see this in the video. I'll be using this card a lot. Um, it just seems to work pretty much without any drivers or anything like that. Just plug it in and dial. Other kind of modems I've got here. These are internal modems. So this small one here, this is a Macintosh modem and it uses the COM slot that's on uh, some of my old Macintosh computers. Uh, typically on some old Macs you might have like a, a one PDS slot for you know maybe a network card and then you've got a COM slot next to it which can be used also for a network card or for modems. So this, uh, this I think generally is found in a lot of the older Performa computers. So I do actually have an old Performa that does have one of these in its uh, comm slot as well. This is a, uh, it's a PCI modem. Uh, I think generally this would be for a, uh, like a Windows based computer. Now this is a full type modem. Uh, it's not what's referred to as a Win modem. Um, a Win modem, you would see a lot less circuitry on the board as it relies on the operating system. Um, to do a lot of its processing. So this is basically like a, a full modem. Um, you've got like a little speaker thingamajig in here and it's noticeably more on the uh, noticeably more circuits here than a, uh, a win modem. I don't actually have a win modem nor am I planning to uh, ever get one. This would be a lot more convenient for compatibility in old computers. So I'll hang on to this and probably use it for uh, one of my old computer builds or something like that. This last one, I'm not even sure if this can be used as an actual modem or if it was designed to uh, control like a large phone system. Um, yeah, this is a, it's an ISA board. It's got its own little processor and RAM on here. It does have the phone port and the line port. Um, this one, it just, it does say it's a fax modem card slash telecopier modem card. So I, I don't really know the details about this. If I take what it's got for its model number and other numbers like that and Google for information, I think the only thing that comes up is like some sort of FCC document, um, which really tells me nothing. So it's not likely I'll be able to find any real information or drivers or anything like that. But because this is such an odd board, I think I'll just hang on to it for a while. I don't know if I'll ever get around to doing anything with it though. So aside from that, the only other modems I have are what I've got in like my Cisco router here. So I've got a, a modem interface card in there, and then below that I do have this other remote access device which has modem modules. One type of modem I don't have is an acoustic coupler, which is kind of like two suction cups that you would put your phone receiver onto. So generally it's a, it's a fairly old type of modem. Um, I wouldn't mind having one of those, but it's not really uh, in line with my interests. So if I stumble across one of those at some point, I might buy it. But other than that, that was my modem collection. As we're attempting to simulate a dial-up ISP, we also need to discuss the modem which will be at the other end of the line. This is the modem which will need to answer the call from the client. While you could simply use another computer with a modem configured to be a remote access server, I'm going to use a Cisco 1760 router with a WIC 2AM module to provide internet service to the client. I'll now take you through a basic dial-up server configuration using the Cisco router and modem module. Alright, so this is my Cisco 1760 router. And if we take a look at what software I've got installed on here, it's essentially the Enterprise 12.4 iOS package. So what we're going to do in uh, this part of the video is do a basic configuration on the Cisco router and allow it to answer the phone calls from the modem clients. So what we'll do, under configuration mode, first thing we do, change our authentication to new model. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what this command does. I did notice that it does change a bit um, how the router authenticates users. Uh, and this is required for this next command which is the authentication for the PPP defaults 
if needed, and local. This will allow the Cisco router to authenticate our point-to-point -point, uh, protocol users using the internal users, which is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to make a username 123, and its password is going to be 123. And that's how all of my dial-up clients will authenticate. Next up, I am going to create a loopback address. This is an IP address that the async interface will use uh, for itself instead of defining the IP address right on the interface. Um, I've been reading a lot of uh, documents on how to do the dial-up configurations and it seemed like a lot of the examples um, used this way instead of doing an IP directly on the async interface. So what we're going to do is specify an IP address for my async interface with a slash 29 netmask on the loopback. Now we go over to our async2 interface, which is the modem that I've got the line connected to. Um, so it will need an IP address, but we do IP unnumbered and then loopback0, which tells the router loopback0 has the IP address for the async interface or something along those lines. Now, um, by default, the encapsulation on the async2 interface was set to slip. We're not going to use slip, we're going to use the point-to-point -point protocol. So, change that to PPP. And we're going to change our async mode to dedicated. There's another option here for interactive, but this is the only thing this thing is doing is answering the PPP calls. Uh, if you're doing interactive, I think that would allow for uh, let me switch interactive. I don't know, but this is all it's doing, so we're just going to say it's dedicated. We're also going to enable this async default routing. Uh, this, I think, allows the async interface to uh, communicate with dynamic routing protocols, which is not something we're doing here, but we're just going to enable this anyway. Uh, it may or may not be required, but who cares? This command tells any peers that call up that this is their IP address. Now, there's a couple options here if you wanted to do a IP pool or DHCP. Uh, in my case here with this router, there's only going to be one client calling in at any time. So giving it a single IP address to use is perfectly fine. doesn't really matter. Next up, this is where we define our PPP authentication. Um, there's a couple options here. The ones that I've actually tested and were successful with are CHAP and PAP. So these are the ones we're going to enable. Um, there is MS CHAP, but when I was using uh, Windows 95 to dial up into this router for testing, the standard CHAP I think just seemed to work. So that's what we're going to roll with. One other option here is IC, or sorry, IPTCP header compression. Um, this is an option that I did see enabled by default on some of my dial-up clients. So by enabling the compression on the server, this might allow header compression to actually occur. Uh, if it doesn't, I don't really care. It's not going to stop the call from, call from dialing in. So having it enabled, as far as I know, isn't going to hurt anything. It still worked just fine before and after I had this thing enabled. There was a bunch of other options I was looking at, like compress options. I had tried with compress predictor. Um, it really screwed up everything. Nothing was working properly. I was also looking at um, kind of like a, a predictive mode on some of these uh, PPP uh, protocols here. So the router would kind of like anticipate the client's message through PPP, but that didn't seem to really help anything. I think I had a lot of problems with the PPP negotiation calls were dropped. So we're, we're going with the, the bare minimum, essentially, to get the, the router to answer calls. So all of that we're just going to leave. Uh, but next up, we do have to actually go in and configure our line interface, because without this configuration, the modem won't actually answer the call. It will ring forever. Here is where we tell it its purpose. This modem is only accepting dial-in. There's a few other options in here. Uh, if you were having your modem do calls uh, inbound and outbound, you would do in out, but that's not what this modem's doing. It's only accepting calls, so we leave it as modem dial-in. Uh, another thing we're just going to enable here for fun, because it won't hurt, is we're just going to set the 
auto configure options on the modem for defaults. Um, I don't really know what this does, but I did see it noted on some examples online, so we're just going to throw it in there. This next command I don't think is actually going to be required because as soon as you hit enter it says, oh, it doesn't work with the async mode dedicated, it has to be interactive, but we're using dedicated and oh, it's useless. I don't care. It was in the examples, we're throwing it in there. Um, I think because the interface is set to dedicated and its encapsulation is PPP, we don't need to tell the line that it might be PPP, it is going to be PPP, so yes, whatever. Anyway. What we're going to do is take a look at our configuration so far. We've got the new model, we've got our authentication method, and we go down. We do have our username 123 and our password 123. We have our loopback interface with the IP address that will be used by the modem for itself. And we do have our async2 modem interface, and it's got its unnumbered configuration for loopback0, the encapsulation, the header compression, dedicated mode, the peer default IP address for our client dialing in, the authentication, and its routing dynamic enabled, but that won't really be in use anyway. Uh, when a client calls in, they'll be assigned this IP address from this line, and I do also have a default static route, so all traffic through the router goes to my next hop, which is the main router for my house. Uh, this is on the fast Ethernet interface that's on the Cisco router. So all traffic that comes through the modem then goes out the Ethernet interface over to my home router. Anyway, continuing on, we'll take a look at our line two configuration. It is modem dial-in. We've got our auto configure type on there. And the auto select PPP does show up even though it's it was complaining about the command and the fact that the mode was dedicated, not interactive. Who cares, it's there. These three lines, these are just default on the line interface. So we will leave those like that. And I don't believe we've written our configuration yet, so we're going to go ahead and write this to memory just in case the power goes out and it takes all of our hard work away. Any day now. There we go. So this Cisco router is now configured to answer phone calls, and I think we're going to get to that shortly. Excellent. So if you're wondering what it is that we just configured, it is this. This is the Cisco 1760 router. Uh, these are pretty cheap on eBay, I think. Uh, this particular one I think I've owned for probably a few years now. Um, I don't recall paying more than maybe $30 for it. Um, and then in this slot here, this is the WIC 2AM modem module. Um, I've also got a T1 module in here, which I used for some other labs. It does also have some spare slots for voice-related uh, add-ons, but um, getting into voice wasn't really uh, something I was looking at. So, um, yeah, just for lab purposes, I did buy this and the modem card some time ago. Didn't really expect I'd do a whole lot with it, but here it is. Uh, on top of that, I do have just a standard Cisco Catalyst switch. This is a 2960. Uh, it's 10100 ports for the most part, a couple of gig ports. I needed to bring this in here because of the number of Ethernet ports I did need for all of the uh, the stuff that's here. These here are my Grandstream HT701 ATAs. So one of these has the phone cable that comes all the way out down to the, uh, the Cisco router here. The other one, uh, the cable goes somewhere, but it's usually um, when I'm testing out my laptop, I've got it sitting on here and that's the modem that goes to this one here. The very bottom, you see this thing. This is a 3Com remote access server. Uh, this is something I was going to originally test out for this project. Um, unfortunately, it seems that uh, this unit is a piece of junk. Uh, I did went through a lot of steps to get the firmware on this unit updated. This thing is incredibly old. The latest firmware, I think the release date was like 2000 or 2001 or something hilarious like that. Um, it was a pain to get that thing installed, and the end result is that it still wouldn't negotiate my incoming calls. So, essentially, I just gave up for now. I mean, it's a neat thing. It's got 
um, like four analog modems inside of it and you do have your LAN port with Ethernet. It's also got a wide area network port. This is like an old serial type connection um, that I do happen to have on another uh, Cisco router here in my house. I've got a, a large Cisco VXR router that has the same serial interface so maybe one day I'll get to building a hilarious giant lab of some sort but yeah, like this thing uses a horrible web interface as well, and the command line is just so terrible. So that's why I end up going with the uh, the Cisco router for this purpose. The next step will be setting up a virtual PBX and pair of ATAs, allowing us to connect our analog modems. If you happen to have two analog phone lines in your house provided by your local phone company, you can skip all of this. I figure most homes may only have one analog phone line, or in my case, I don't have any. For my project, I chose a PBX solution called 3CX and attached a pair of Grandstream HT701 analog telephone adapters. I'll also note that this experiment relies on having the locally hosted PBX to handle everything. Attempting to use modems over commercial VoIP service more than likely won't work very well as providers typically use compression and low bandwidth encoders since voice alone requires far less bandwidth than a modem. Without an external service, we're limited to attaching the modems to the PBX as extensions and then having one dial the other. Now let's take a look at 3CX with our modem extensions. All right, so there were a couple solutions I was looking at uh, for my hosted um, PBX. Uh, this one is 3CX. Uh, this wasn't my first choice. I was actually hoping to uh, work with, I think, Free PBX or one of those uh, like uh, asterisk uh, backend type systems because um, I, re I really have no idea what the back end of this is. So, uh, but. Um, yeah, getting with the uh, the free PBX, it was a, there was a lot of complicated settings, uh, especially for someone who didn't really have a, a lot of phone experience. So I wasn't getting anywhere that quickly. Uh, I did get my extensions um, set up, and there were some strange problems where they would unregister themselves, and uh, one of my uh, Grandstream ATAs actually seemed to fry itself at some point. So. Uh, things were really not looking up for me, and I was uh, just searching around, and I found 3CX, and I decided to uh, install this. Basically, all you do is um, you just kind of go to this try area, fill out your name and all that information. Um, it tells you that they'll give you, like, free cloud hosting and stuff like that. I mean, like, I didn't care about that. I just wanted the actual ISO to download. Uh, so you fill out the information, um, you'll get the download link for the install ISO, which I think is like a Red Hat based system when you actually uh, boot uh, boot up it. Um, I think I've just used a, um, installed it into a virtual machine. Um, they will have to uh, email you like a trial license key of some sort, so make sure you do put uh, your actual email address in there. Uh, so yeah, you just boot up the uh, boot up the ISO, do a default install. Um, it does the rest for you. When it finally comes up, it will give you an interface that looks something like this. Uh, if we go to our dashboard, um, I've had this system up here for I think maybe uh, a week or two. Um, it's got like you know all of this setup that I was trying to do for external access. I, I didn't care about any of that, so that didn't really matter. I just threw some random junk in there. Uh, the main thing that I was looking for is getting my extension set up. So uh, this is a fairly default install of the 3CX software. I don't think I've actually changed any settings at all in here. Um, as soon as I completed the default install, I immediately started poking through down here and I noticed there's this uh, option here called fax extensions. Now this, I mean obviously I'm not using a fax machine, but I'm not necessarily using a voice phone either. So what I decided to do is set up my two ATAs as fax extensions, considering they were going to be modems calling each other. So uh, there's one thing that I'll mention um, that limits the extension number to five characters, which uh, on, uh, I was looking at free PBX, and I could like I could pretend to have like a, a full seven-digit phone number, which was kind of neat for hearing all of the dialing tones. 
Um, but this has a five uh, character limit, so we're going to have to settle for five. What I've done is I just generated two extensions under here with random numbers. Um, there's really not much that you need to configure. So if you look at adding an extension, um, make up an extension number. Um, the authentication ID, um, I used the same uh, number for the extension um, for the sake of simplicity. And then for a password, I just use like the word password with a number after it because I mean, I'm not really concerned about security for this. This is just like all a bunch of fun and pointless stuff. So yeah. So that creates your two extensions. Uh, once that's done, we'll pop over to my, uh, this is one of my grand stream ATAs. This is the HT701. Um, it's, I haven't really changed any settings in here. Uh, as soon as I plugged it in, it DHCP'd onto my network. Um, so as soon as it uh, came up, I logged in. Uh, so if we look at the advanced settings, I mean, there's really nothing I've configured. Um, yeah, there's, I'm not doing any SSL related stuff. None of that doesn't matter. Uh, go over to X, uh, sorry, the FXS port. There we go. Uh, this IP address that you throw in here, this is the IP of the 3CX virtual machine that I deployed. Toss that in there. Um, so my SIP user ID, 29641. Uh, if we pop back to this screen here, this is indeed one of the fax extensions. And the extension number and the authentication ID, both that same number. So when we pop back to the grand stream, the authentication ID is that number as well. Um, now the password shows up as blank here because it's already saved and it's purposely not displayed. But I enter the password, which was like password 12 or some random crap like that. Threw it in there. The rest of these settings on this particular screen, um, I haven't changed anything. It's still set to uh, standard UDP. I think most of these other options are all the defaults. Yeah, by default, I think PCMU will be your top vocoder. Um, these two are the better ones, uh, either or, that you'd want to use. Um, they are the, I think, like the highest bandwidth and lowest compressed ones. So these have the highest chance of letting a modem talk to another modem uh, without having the whole thing get garbled up. So, yeah. Rest of these options, yeah, I, I think this is all the default. Um, this particular uh, ATA, this was, uh, I bought this just recently, it was brand new in box. So when I powered it up, I did a firmware update and I think everything else in here was unchanged. And when you go to the status page, it does say that my extension is registered to the PBX and it's all good. My extensions are all there. If we go down, yep, here's my two ATAs and they're both registered. So uh, this was definitely the easiest way to do it, I think. Um, I would have liked to demo uh, like free PBX with the asterisk backend, uh, but I think that would probably make this an extremely long video and I would have had to do a lot more research myself. Um, I just wanted to simply deploy this as easy as possible. I uh, didn't want to hassle with configurations or anything like that. I just wanted to get one modem calling another modem. How hard could that possibly be? Well, it turns out it was really difficult until I ran into this. So, yeah, 3CX with the Grand Stream. I've uh, got basically the pair of Grand Stream HT701s. Uh, I was trying to use, I had an HT701 and if it was an HT486. Uh, the 486 ATA that I had, it was an older model and yeah it like fried itself after uh, a bunch of my tests so i did have to pick up another one of these 701s uh so far they are working good um the modems negotiate uh, decent speeds so yeah surprisingly this is uh this is working out so yeah if you're trying to deploy this yourself um using the 3cx free trial whatever and uh, the grand stream hg701s yeah it seems that this just basically works. So to pretty much get started with our adventures of dial-up, I'm going to be using the Apple Macintosh PowerBook 180. Uh, this is 
fairly decent laptop. It's a 33 megahertz 68030 processor, I believe. Uh, this unit has been slightly upgraded. It's got, I think, 14 megabytes of RAM and like a 500 odd megabyte hard drive. So it's uh, pretty decent specs for its time. Uh, this particular laptop does actually have an internal modem which has been added. However, I'm actually going to be running the Supra Express 33.6 modem in this particular test. This is the one that actually has a standard serial port and it gets its power from the ADB port on the back of the computer. It's a pretty neat modem. So yeah, we're going to get set up with this modem and uh, test our dial-up modems. Alright, so I've got the Mac booted up now. Uh, this Mac is running system 7.6.1. Uh, so for the PVP connectivity, it does actually use Open Transport um, for its networking. Uh, there's older versions of the Mac system software where you had to use like Mac TCP and free PPP. Uh, I don't necessarily have uh, a whole lot of old Macs that run like system 7.0 or 7.1. So for this example, we are going to be using Open Transport, which works out good because one of the applications I'm going to test later actually requires Open Transport. So what we're going to do now is I've got the modem placed up here. We've got the extension number 54837 entered into the dialer and my username and password 123 has been entered. And let's give this a go. And as you can see there, uh, we do have a PPP negotiation at a decent modem speed. Um, yeah, where you're essentially dialed up into our own router. So I think coming up next, I'll demonstrate some uh, old applications, kind of give you an idea of what a typical laptop user might have been doing back on uh, dial-up internet days. All right, so hopefully this shows up okay. Uh, we're just going to take a look at a few applications I've got here. Starting off with probably one of the more popular types of applications. This is the web browser. We're going to run Netscape Navigator 4.0. Yeah. Oh, home.netscape.com is not found. Oh no. Uh, we're going to try going to a website I keep running for purposes such as this. It's altexanet.org. Wow, this is super slow. Finally. Wow, uh, it's still loading something. I don't think it's finally done now. So this is like a extreme basic HTML page. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's just barely able to keep the, uh, the animated images there going. So yeah, this is a site that uh, I just keep running specifically to test old machines and browsers. Uh, if we tried going to Google in Netscape 4, uh, it would look horrible. So I, I don't think I'm even bother. Um, so, I mean, back in these days, if you weren't web browsing, uh, you might be using different programs. Let's take a look at another one here, Hotline Client. This is, uh, this is a big one for me. Um, back in the late 90s, uh, I was actually running a hotline server from uh, my old Mac on a dial-up connection that I had on a private phone line in my house. So if we launch up the hotline client, and if you go through the bookmarks that come with every hotline client, actually if you pick the one that says Boffo Mac, uh, this will still take you to a public server that uh, I keep running. So we'll take a look down here. It's waiting to connect. There we go. Agreement comes up. 
So, I mean, this was, uh, this was Hotline back in the day. You had a, uh, a news thing here where, you know, people could post essentially whatever they want. Um, you had your users list here. This is me on the PowerBook 180. A chat window here, public chat. And if we pop open into the files, I don't really remember it being this slow, but it very well could have been. I think my modem dropped my call. It says it's connected, however, the modem light... Oh, there it goes, you've been disconnected. Oh, excellent. Ah, uh, I think we go back to hotline, my connection has been closed, oh no. Alright, well, it's not much to see in hotline anyway. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to reconnect again. Let's not waste time. Uh, another app we're going to take a look at. Uh, this is Turbo Gopher. <laughs> uh, you're not likely to find a whole lot of uh, Gopher servers still running, um, but I do happen to have one. Uh, if we drop into gopher.altexanet.org, and this obviously didn't uh, turn out quite how I expected it to. Um, but yeah, this is an actual Gopher server that uh, is publicly running. Um, there's not a whole lot of content in the server, although there is a full mirror of textfiles.com. This is a mirror that's maintained by one of my websites. Um, so, yeah. You can access all of textfiles.com right through my uh, Gopher server. I don't see any reason why you'd want to do that, but uh, the option is there for you. So, yeah, that's, I think, I think it's interesting. Okay, we're going to take a look at FTP. Right now we're using a program called Fetch. Uh, yeah, I remember using uh, this for FTP way back in the 90s. So, what I've got here is I've got a public FTP server, ftp.atlas.altexa.net. Uh, bunch of stuff we can do in here. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the images. Uh, computer. Uh, let's go to Apple. Well, I'm going to download a picture of, I think it's a Quadra 700. Let's get this file. And we'll save this to the desktop. And... Uh, where'd my file go? Come on, out of the way. Uh, come on. This is it. We'll drag it into the web browser. Yeah, in these days everything was slow. I mean, I'm reading an image off of the hard drive in the web browser and it's going at modem speeds. So yeah, this is a picture of a Macintosh Quadra 700 I downloaded from my own FTP server over dial-up on the PowerBook 180. Everything you want to do, it just takes so long. So... Another thing people might be doing is remote administration of servers. So if we open up NCSA Telnet. And 
let's say I want to connect to, there is a SGI Indy. Oops. Remember my own IP address that I've got in my house here? I'll try teleting to it. Okay, so we've got our Unix login. So, yeah, that's kind of neat. Uh, basically just have a Telnet session established with a uh, the SGI Indie that I've got in the other room there. So, if you were doing remote administration of the system, you can do anything like this. And here's me logged in as root, and this is the IP address that we uh, previously discussed in the router configuration, 172.16.10.2. So yeah, basically just an example of how we've got the routing through the Cisco router um, to this other, uh, this other machine that I've got, so yep, pretty neat for mobile computing. So the next computer we're going to demonstrate is a Toshiba Pentium laptop, and it's got Windows 95 installed, and this unit does not have an onboard modem, so we do have a PC card modem, which is in the slot here. And then we've got the cable that runs back over to the ATA. So this is Windows 95, and naturally it uses its built-in dial-up networking to handle the network connections. So let's take a look at that. So for the dial-up settings, uh, one thing I did note before when we were doing the router configuration, uh, there is, if we go down here, there is an option that says use IP header compression. I believe that is the option that uh, the Cisco router had available when we were doing that configuration, the uh, TCP header uh, compression. So this is enabled by default it seems, because I didn't manually enable that. So uh, potentially when I dial into the router from this computer there might actually be that level of compression, though I am not entirely sure. Uh, I did notice there is another thing here where it says enable software compression. Uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with the connection to the router or not. Um, like I said, I did run into problems when I was doing the uh, other levels of compression on the, uh, the Cisco router. So whether or not that actually works or not, I have no idea. So let's just cancel out of this, go back to the actual connection. So same thing, username and password 123, got my extension in there, and let's dial this up. For some reason, it doesn't actually give you all of the sounds of the modem. This logging on network thing might be a Microsoft specific thing. I think if you uh, don't enable that, it might still work. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think that's if you were trying to use like Microsoft uh, file sharing or something over the connection. Uh, anyway, we are connected at 14.4, uh, which is the speed of the modem that's inside of the, uh, the PC card slot. Uh, if we hop over to my command screen, I was testing this earlier. Let's do a Google Ping test, and uh, yeah, we're, we're getting like 380, 400 millisecond ping times, so, you know, it is it is slow. Uh, another thing we're going to do is uh, we're actually going to open uh, Internet Explorer 5. It's going to try loading MSN, which I really do not want it to do. Ah, uh, here we go, I'm going to look at Google. Because I have tested this before, um, Google actually decently renders in Internet Explorer 5. And that's kind of surprising. But, uh, yeah. And let's say I want to search for Paul's old crap. Oh, could be insecure. Oh, no. Let's see what comes up. 
Ah, we got some Paul's old crap stuff here. The wiki. And obviously we're now into whatever the hell this stuff is. But, oh, you can see uh, my last video is actually uh, in the results here. Apple Unix on the Mac SE30. If I scroll any further, it might just turn into... The Apostle Paul uses the word shit. Uh, okay. So, a bunch of just garbage then. That's neat. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any other uh, Windows computers. I would have liked to uh, demonstrate Trumpet Windsock on like a 486 with Windows 3.11. Uh, unfortunately, my Windows build, or my 486 build, isn't quite uh, ready yet. Had some problems with uh, getting video working on the board, so I don't have uh, a 3.11 build. So, yeah, Windows 95 does the dial-up uh, as just as good as the, uh, the Mac did, I think. So, uh, let's see what else I can dial up now. Alright, so another system I have here is my Apple Macintosh PowerBook 3400. Uh, this unit does come with a built-in modem, but uh, for this experiment I'm going to use the 14.4 PC card modem that I also used in the uh, Windows 95 laptop. When the card is inserted in Mac OS 9, it actually gives you an icon on the desktop. So it's the XJ1144, and it opens up the modem control panel where you specify it's that specific card, and the modem type, uh, megahertz cruise card 14.4, I think that either is or the closest match to it. So we're going to go ahead and close out the modem control panel. Um, one difference between this system and the PowerBook 180 that we were uh, testing this out with, uh, instead of calling this control panel PPP, it's now referred to as remote access. Um, as you can see, it looks almost identical to the uh, PPP control panel, uh, but they, they basically just changed a few things around, so now it's remote access instead. So we've already got our 123 user and the extension number in there, we're going to go ahead and call it. So as you can see, we are connected, and I'm not going to uh, demo too much in here, but I do have a copy of Internet Explorer 5 for the Macintosh, and I'm just going to take a look at going to Google. So it does load um, and renders the page. Uh, you know, fairly accurately, uh, much like uh, it was on the Windows 95 system, which was also Internet Explorer 5. I mean, there's not really a whole lot else you could do here. I mean, I could try going to YouTube. <laughs> nope. Uh, anything with uh, SSL, that's pretty much not going to work. So, I mean, you can still do actual Google searches, but... Uh, yeah, you're, you're really not going to be going anywhere else on these old systems, unfortunately. So the last system we're going to look at today is the Apple Newton Message Pad 2000. Uh, this particular unit I uh, picked up on eBay a long, long time ago, and its, it's previous owner had dial-up information already set up in there. Uh, I think it was previously used at, like, NASA. Uh, it was interesting seeing all that information still in there. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite working out as I expected. Um, I'm going to have to, like, reformat the whole thing or something like that. But for now, I'll just demonstrate how the modem actually works, though I won't be able to make it connect to the internet. What I'm doing here, it's just a standard PC card modem. This is the same card I used on uh, the laptop demonstrations. So, once the card is inserted, it'll tell us that 
a communications device has been inserted. Sure. So this is the tricky part. Uh, the internet program that I had on here, it uh, it's basically throwing errors all over the place. So all I'm really going to do is just get this thing to place a call. So we'll just open up calls. Uh, let's see. Let's call a number. The number we're going to call is the extension. So that would be five four. Eight three seven. Close that. Place the call, and we're going to place it using the modem. Yes, that is correct. And call. I don't really need the area code. So, hung up the call because obviously it's not going to do anything. Uh, this program is expecting a voice response. Um, I'm not able to currently set up the internet on here. Um, that'll be done, I think, for a later video I do specifically about the Newton. But this is just a demonstration of the Newton's ability to use a modem and then calling through the uh, ATAs that we have over here. Would have been nice to uh, really get this going. It's got a web browser already in here, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have that much experience with the Newtons, so it's going to be something I will look in at a later date. In conclusion, making your own home dial-up ISP is easy to do, assuming you already have all the required hardware sitting around like I do. There's really no practical use for this setup unless you've got old computers which don't support any other networking. I did enjoy getting this project done, though, as it reminded me of my early internet days in the 90s. To wrap things up, here's some screenshots of legacy dial-up services with some inspirational music playing in the background.